On a quiet Thursday afternoon, the peaceful atmosphere of the local police dispatch room in one of the smallest cities in Alabama was disrupted by an unexpected voice over the 911 line. A brief, innocent call that would touch the hearts of all those present and change the course of many people's lives. The office was quiet, as had been usual in recent months, and especially in the last two weeks of a particularly hot summer. It was so hot that no one dared to commit crimes or anything else, because there were hardly any people on the streets for fear of heat stroke. Everyone who could was barricaded in their homes with an army of fans around them. But even high temperatures couldn't stop a police officer from doing his duty. On that late August night, officers Carter and Elisa were on duty and would be the ones to act in case of an emergency. It looked like that night was going to be as boring as all the others, until the sound of an incoming call broke the silence and brought them to their senses. Hello, good evening. Can you bring me a happy meal, please? On the other side of the line, there was a young and innocent voice that did not reveal being aware of the meaning of calling the emergency number in the middle of the night. Elisa, who was a seasoned professional known for her compassionate nature, paused for a moment, touched by the child's request laced with naivety. At first, she thought the child must have gotten the wrong number or was simply playing a joke on her. In any case, she decided not to hang up and engage the child in conversation to find out a little more. She took a deep breath and answered warmly, Hi honey, I think you have the wrong number. Is your mom or dad there? If you let me talk to them, we can clear it up. But the boy seemed determined to get what he set out to do and insisted on his initial request. They can't get on the phone. They're sleeping now. I just want a happy meal. I'm so hungry. Please, can you have them bring it home for me? As he said it, the boy's voice seemed to fade to a soft whimper, touching Elisa's heartstrings and making her start to get nervous, fearing that this innocent call was hiding something much more serious. Sensing that it might be more than just a child's whim, Elisa considered the possibility that there might be an underlying problem that required her immediate intervention. After all, Children often innocently ask for help in situations they cannot fully articulate because they are not old enough to understand them or express what they are feeling. Okay, sweetheart, don't worry, I'll help you. Please don't hang up, Elisa told him, trying to keep the boy on the phone to trace the call and make sure he was okay. With a mixture of concern and urgency, Elisa was able to quickly locate the source of the call. It came from a neighborhood on the outskirts of the city. It was one of the poorest areas of the entire city, which only increased the woman's concern. It was then that she decided to send two field agents to the scene to make sure the boy was okay and to find out the real reasons that had led him to make that mysterious call in the middle of the night. Grace, Benedict, please, you need to go to this address. I'm afraid the boy who lives in this house is in trouble. Can you go and see what's going on? Thank you, she said to the two agents in a deep voice, that indicated her concern for the boy. Wasting no time, the two agents headed for the address, their minds prepared for the possible situation of encountering the sad reality of an abandoned child. Do you think Elisa was overreacting by sending us here? You know, kids love to play pranks, Benedict asked his partner when they were barely five minutes away from arriving at the house from which the call originated. If she thinks there might be a child in danger, we need to find out and make sure everything is okay. And if it's not, you know what we'll have to do. We are police officers. Our job is to take care of others, no matter if they are children or adults, replied Officer Grace with a serious look on her face. But they did not have to wait long to realize that Elisa's suspicions were more than justified. When they arrived at the address they had been given, the scene that greeted them did nothing to alleviate their concerns. Quite the contrary. It was a modest, abandoned-looking house. The front door was slightly open, and the toys strewn across a neglected lawn spoke of neglect, perhaps even distress. It was precisely the toys, usually vibrant signs of childhood, and the joy of a family with children that now seemed like abandoned relics on the desolate grass of that house that looked like it was about to collapse. As they stepped out of their patrol car, officers Grace and Benedict felt a shiver run down their spines, the weight of possible discovery pressing on their chests. They crossed the threshold cautiously 
and announced their presence with a clear authoritative tone that managed to disguise the apprehension they felt about entering that inhospitable place. Alabama police, is anyone here? Identify yourselves, shouted one of the officers. The agent's voice echoed through the dimly lit entry halls of the small house, and her call was met with an unsettling silence that only added to the tension. The air inside was stale, filled with a palpable sense of abandonment and filth that made it hard to breathe. It was clearly not the home of a happy family, or even a family at all. And here lives a child. How is that possible? Even I couldn't stay in here for more than an hour without feeling short of breath, commented Agent Benedict as they entered the house in complete darkness. Both agents let their eyes adjust to the gloom and cautiously entered the living room in the center of the house. What they discovered there made their blood run cold. The scene that unfolded before them gave them an involuntary shudder, and they were momentarily speechless, staring motionless at what was before their eyes, not quite believing their eyes. On a ratty old couch lay two figures, eerily motionless in the shadowy light of a switched-on television. The room was in chaos, with medicine bottles strewn across the coffee table and floor, along with other bottles of dubious provenance piled in one of the corners, painting a distressing picture of interrupted and unhappy lives. Agent Benedict's throat tightened as he surveyed the scene. Each empty jar was a silent testament to the deep despair that could have gripped the adults who now lay unconscious before them and the tragedy they must be experiencing. As Agent Grace went to check the back rooms for others, and the boy who had made the call, Benedict cautiously approached the figures lying on the couch to see if they were still alive. They were alive. Fortunately, the pulse was there, faint and thready under his fingers, a small relief in the midst of overwhelming tension. Meanwhile, a few yards from the living room, Grace came upon a cluttered bedroom amidst a landscape of discarded clothes and old toys. The agent knew instantly that she was not alone and pointed her flashlight into a corner of the room. The beam of light from Grace's flashlight landed on a small makeshift tent of blankets that only a child could hide in. And indeed, it was underneath. Hidden among the blankets was a small boy clutching a cordless phone with two large bluish eyes full of fear and confusion. Grace felt very sad to see the boy in that state and felt sorry for him. Then she knelt down beside him gingerly and her heart shrank at the sight of his vulnerability. Hello, champ. My name is Grace and my partner and I are here to help you, she said gently, reaching out to lift him up. He flinched at her touch a reflex born of the fear he felt. But recognizing his savior, he clung to her and wrapped his small arms around her neck. Are you the lady I spoke to on the phone? Will you bring me a happy meal? Asked the excited little boy. Grace was very excited to hear him say that and could not refuse. You will get your happy meal, I promise, but now we have to go. It will be all right, little boy. What is your name? She said, smiling and taking him out of that painful place. Jack, miss, my name is Jack, and I'm very glad to see you, replied the boy, smiling for the first time. Outside, the flashing lights of the reinforcement cars that Agent Benedict had requested a few minutes before gave a little light and color to the night. While the juvenile services, a couple of ambulances, and more agents arrived to thoroughly search the house and analyze everything that was there, the two adults found in the living room unconscious were quickly treated and transported to the hospital. At the same time, the toddler was removed. The once silent neighborhood now murmured with the activity of care and law enforcement. It was a stark reminder of the fragile lives it harbors. As the community echoed Jack's plight, a groundswell of solidarity and support washed through the streets of the small town. Neighbors, Local businesses and even strangers from adjacent areas gathered to weave a dense tapestry of care and concern around the young boy whose life had suddenly leapt into the public spotlight. Jack, with his innocence and unwavering spirit, quickly and completely unintentionally became a beacon of resilience that galvanized the entire community to become more aware of and involved in the town's child welfare issues. 
After spending a couple of days in the hospital and a week in a social services protection center, Jack was placed in a foster home that exuded warmth and security, where his life began to thrive. For her part, Agent Grace, who had been instrumental in his rescue, visited him regularly, and on each visit, she brought him a happy meal, a simple and cheerful reminder of how they had met and formed a strong bond of friendship in such unusual and dramatic circumstances. Jack's face always lit up at the sight of the familiar red box overflowing with fries and delicious freshly made hamburgers, symbolic of a wish fulfilled. Jack's story and his rescue caused such a stir in the community that within months, a local initiative was launched to educate parents and children alike about the importance of emergency services and their role in family safety at all levels. Workshops were organized, pamphlets were distributed, and school programs were implemented so that all children would know how and when to call for help, transforming their conception of safety and security. From the sad and inspiring story of Jack and his parents, a new culture of vigilance began to define the city, changing the way neighbors looked out for each other. Ultimately, the innocent emergency call from a starving child did more than safeguard his own life. It sparked a widespread movement. It was a poignant reminder that the smallest voices often have the power to bring about significant change. Did this touching and surprising story resonate with you? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. For more inspiring tales, subscribe to our channel or explore the other videos displayed below. Thank you for your support.